All right, this is the Rules and Principles Project. In this, we're going to be discussing some of the basics of arena soccer, some rules that might be different from outdoor soccer or futsal, and then also some defensive principles and attacking principles. I want this to be just a very introductory um, project that as you go through this, you might encounter a lot of information. Now, I might touch on topics here and there, but will not go into a ton of detail. That detail will be discussed in further projects. So I'm kind of dumping my brain in this project right here. And then from here, if we discuss, for example, different zones, I will spend specific time talking on each of those. So starting off here, just going through the rules and principles of arena soccer. Uh, this picture at the top is from our very last game from our first season in MASL3. And we were able to play in CQ Arena where the Baltimore Blast play. And we ended up losing our semifinal game that day. Um, some notable rules I put in here, um, a picture from our home venue from last year with the referee uh, in the picture as well. Um, the referees are responsible for keeping the rules throughout the game. Sometimes they do an excellent job. Sometimes they do an okay job. And sometimes, well, maybe we could do a little better. But with that being said, um, we know that nobody's perfect. We make mistakes every game when we play. The referees also at times make mistakes. But just getting into the laws of the game, some specifics and some basics if you're first entering arena soccer for the first time. Um, the game is played 6v6. There are five field players and a goalie. Um, there are four 15-minute quarters, and the clock starts and stops. It's not a running clock. It starts and it stops every single time the ball goes out of play. Um, so really, we're playing 60 minutes of soccer, and it's very fast-paced. Uh, each team has two 60-second timeouts. Um, some teams don't decide to use those. We will use those every single game, um, whether that be to reset lines or to even just give us an extra breather. Uh, we will make sure to tactically use those timeouts. If we haven't used one at some point in the first half, expect that we typically use it before the end of the first and then the second one at some point in the second half. Um, it's pretty rare that we go into halftime having both timeouts. Um, sometimes it happens, but um, being able to use the walls is an important part of the game. Uh, we play on an arena soccer field with walls. Uh, you know, it's different from outdoor, it's different from futsal. When the ball goes out of play, typically everything stops and everyone has a breather. That doesn't happen in arena soccer. Even when the ball does go out, there are a lot of quick restarts that happen in this game. So even though there's walls, uh, there are times when the ball will go out. They will go over top of the goal. Also on goals, the time stops when the goal, when goals are scored, uh, the timer stops and that's when lines shift. And we'll talk about that later too. Um, so the ball stays in play a lot and it's very fast paced. Um, it's a physical game. Throughout this project, I'll have different examples. There's different video examples. And this example right here, I think it's a player that just gets crushed and no call. And then just keep playing. Uh, so when you have time, go through, click on the links, look at them. Um, and I'm sure even as, uh, as I find additional videos or as we watch videos throughout the year, I might be updating these. And you might see a few different examples of physical play in there, more than just one. And that goes for all the potential video links in here. In arena soccer, there are four zones on the field. You have zone one, zone two, zone three, and zone four. Uh, zone one is assuming the goalkeeper has the ball in zone one, uh, our own goalkeeper, and we're attacking in zone four. And the same thing where if our goalie was on this side of the field, then it would run zone one, zone two, zone three, zone four. But really, zone one is whatever goal we are defending. Okay, so this would be zone one. You see this yellow line right here. 
which separates, goes into zone two, the midfield line, zone three, the third line, which we'll talk about later too, and then zone four. That's very important because throughout the game and throughout today even, we'll talk about some of the significance behind each zone. Uh, for the next few weeks, we'll be breaking down, or next few projects, we'll be breaking down each zone and making sure that you have some specific information on how to defend and how to attack in each of those zones. Okay, so the ball that we use, it's a bit different from an outdoor soccer ball. It's different from a futsal ball. It's very bouncy. It bounces off the walls differently. So, you know, when you get to training, um, hit the ball a few times off the wall uh, just to get used to it. Right. Sometimes you're anticipating the ball to hop off and it'd be a slow bounce off the wall, but it might skip really past fast you. That's very common, especially uh, on different fields we play on. Some walls we play on will be a harder surface. Some will be a glass wall. So it's important to be able to get used to the wall when we show up to games as well. Getting used to away teams, walls, their fields. Um, some teams play on turf, uh, some play on carpet. So that's important to identify too. Um, it, it is different from the other balls that we've used in the past, an outdoor soccer ball or futsal ball. Positions. Uh, these are at least the positions that we play here with the Baltimore Kings. Uh, we have a goalkeeper. Um, other teams might play differently. This is how we play. Uh, we have one fixed defender, uh, even though he's in the very back, you might also see him make runs up the field, um, which I'll talk about later too, but we have defender, maybe even two of them are defenders. Um, at some, somewhere there's a mix between one defender and two midfielders or two defenders and one midfielder, uh, depending on lines, depending on player availability, um, depending on how the game's going. Maybe we shift up our lines. So we have these three that are building out of the back. We have a second forward and we have a target forward. Okay. Uh, our goalkeeper has the ball in zone one, distributes the ball to players, and we work the ball up the field. Um, defensive clearances. This is one of the more, um, I mean, if I'm looking at notable rules, that was the name of this section. One of the biggest rules that I see in this game and important to follow and important to get used to pretty quickly is identifying what a defensive clearance is. So let's say a goalkeeper or any field player is in zone one and they're getting pressured and they kick the ball and it goes out of play in the air. It hits the net over here. Um, it just goes over top of the wall. Uh, you name it. If the ball is taken from zone one and kicked in the air out of play. The other team has a free kick from this line, this dot right here, a top of our top of the arc free kick. And most teams will score off of this. Um, you should be scoring at least 50% of these opportunities. I personally believe that this is one of the biggest, I guess, biggest things to quickly realize in this game is that when you're pressured in zone one, sometimes it might make sense just to pass the ball out. Um, if you're severely under pressure, I'd rather you lose the ball in one of these zones than just kick the ball over top. Let them be able to set up over top the ball right here for a free kick. Okay, so just recognizing that this is zone one. Zone two, zone three, and zone four. That when we're in zone one, right? Um, anything, when you're being pressed and you kick the ball out, just kick it out of the wall. You know, it might make sense in outdoor soccer. It might make sense in futsal. In arena soccer, it does not make sense to just kick the ball. Please do not do that. Um, that will be one of the quickest ways to make me frustrated. <laughs> is to just kick the ball out because the other team is going to have a free kick right here. They're going to score off of it most likely. And you might hear some words from me. So with that, uh, we also have a result, as I said, top of our free kick, some examples right here. If you would like to look through them, you're more than welcome to uh, some video examples. 
Uh, a three-line violation, what's a three-line violation? A three-line violation is a rule that allows that disallows a player from kicking the ball in the air from zone one in the air to zone four. A player cannot do that. Now they can kick the ball on the ground to zone four, but ball's in the air. If I chip a ball up and it lands in zone two, that's okay. If I chip a ball up and it lands in zone three, that's okay. If I hit a long driven ball in the air and it lands in zone four, they're going to take the ball, they're going to pick it up, and they're going to move it right to here. Not far from here. <laughs> so on, on some fields, depending on where that line is, it could be pushed back a little bit, but it's still a free kick at the top of a dangerous area. So we want to be aware of that, that if we're being pressured in the back, um, sometimes in outdoor, it might make sense just to kick the ball out. In futsal, it might make sense to kick the ball out. In arena soccer, they're trying to prevent players from just kicking the ball as far as they can and clearing it. Uh, they want you to be able to control the ball. They want you to be able to have the ball at your feet and be comfortable with it. The game does not uh, suit players that don't have good feet. They want players to be able to get the ball under pressure and move the ball on the ground out or even advance the ball to zone two. If you advance the ball to zone two, like let's say this player gets the ball and he advances the ball on the dribble to zone two, he can play the ball anywhere he wants then. He can play a ball in the air from zone two to zone four. It just can't go over three lines. That's why it's called the three-line violation. So it can't go over three lines. Here's line one, here's line two, and here's line three. So the ball can't go in the air over top of it. Now, once again, you can pass the ball on the ground and start in zone one and roll all the way to zone four, that's fine. But it cannot be in the air. Um, the result, as I mentioned, would be a free kick right here. But the exception is that a goalkeeper is allowed to throw the ball as far as they want. The goalkeeper box is rectangular. It does not include this D right here. This is the goalkeeper box. If the goalkeeper gets the ball in their hands, he can throw the ball as far as he wants. So if um, goalkeeper gets the ball in the box and he doesn't see any options, he can throw the ball into zone four, or we might have a player down in zone four already or right here on the third line uh, that can run into zone four and get the ball. So goalkeeper can throw as far as they want. They can throw it in the air. They can throw it on the ground, but they have to stay inside of their box when they release the ball. Okay, that's pretty important to know. Um, some people don't know that, and some people take advantage of it. A goalkeeper actually can throw the ball all the way down the field into the other goal, and that count as a goal. So if the other team's um, playing sixth attacker, I'll explain what that means later. If the other team's playing sixth attacker, uh, and, you know, they've pulled their goalie for an extra field player, and the goalkeeper gets the ball here, he can throw the ball. If his arm is, is good enough, he can throw the ball all the way down the field and score. <laughs> so that, that is a rule that is allowed. So that's the exception. The goalkeeper can throw the ball as far as he wants. Um, goalkeeper touch limit. Uh, the goalkeeper will have um, two touches. The goalkeeper is allowed to... Get the ball originally in their hands, let's say off a, off a restart. They can roll the ball out with their hands and then can also receive the ball at their feet. So they're allowed one. Well, I, I said they're allowed two touches. That is if they have the ball in their hands. If play starts and the goalkeeper passes it out, uh, you cannot play the goalkeeper again. So making sure that when the goalkeeper gets the ball and rolls it out, you can still play him one time. But once the goalkeeper has played the ball with their feet, they are not allowed to touch the ball again in that possession. Now, if the other team wins the ball, goes down, and even just touches the ball away from you, and then you play back, that's okay. The goalkeeper can play the ball again. So when the goalkeeper is on their own side of the field, so I'll – Pull this up. If the goalkeeper is on this half of the field in zone one or zone two, they can only touch the ball with their feet once per possession. 
Okay. Um, so with that, also, if you were to pull the goalkeeper and the goalkeeper, uh, or even, I guess not even pull the goalkeeper, if you have a goalkeeper on uh, in zone three or zone four, they have unlimited touches in zone three or zone four. But in zone one, zone two, they have only one touch with their feet. I'm sorry, one possession with their feet. I keep saying touch. They're allowed to receive the ball. Once they receive the ball at their feet, they have four seconds to get rid of it. So, you know, goalkeeper gets the ball in his hands, rolls it out. They then play the goalkeeper again. He has four seconds to get rid of it. And once he gets rid of it with his feet during that possession, he cannot touch the ball again in zone one or zone two. He can touch the ball again in zone three or zone four. All right. Um, cards. Okay. There are different cards in arena soccer. You may be used to yellow cards and red cards, um, which are pretty similar here in arena soccer, but also we have blue cards. Um, blue cards um, are for different offenses. It might just be a random foul that happens and the referee gives you a blue card. <clears throat> now in the laws of the game, when I say random foul, you might think, what did I do? We're going to discuss the laws of the game. Um, first, you know, it might be a foul. That might be a reason why. Um, um, there might be a time where you shove someone into the boards. That's called boarding. You cannot board someone. That's a blue card offense. If someone's running down the boards and you bump into them and they go flying into the boards and boom. Usually, if I'm playing too, right, you try to make the loud noise into the board in order to make it sound like you've got hit really hard into the boards. Um, now, sometimes people are hit really hard in the boards and can't, um, and, and can't react. But if you're running down the boards and someone bumps into you and you ram into the boards, that is called boarding. You cannot do that. Uh, that's a blue card offense. And then you play a man down. So um, blue cards give you a, give you two minutes in the penalty box. Um, the player who ends up, um, fouling or ends up getting the blue card goes to the penalty box for two minutes um, or until the first goal is scored by your team. So you can kill. Um, I'm sorry. Let me rephrase that. Once the team, once the clock has run out two minutes, or if your team scores, when you're a man up, the power play is over, right? And you've scored the man up goal and the fifth player goes back out there. Um, with that, uh, we also have four foul accumulation. If you accumulate four fouls in one half, that is an automatic blue card. So the referees will keep, be keeping track of fouls like basketball. Uh, a blue card is given for a subbing violation, which is where a player runs on the field too early that a player is running off the field, has not gotten all the way off the field, and the player runs on too early, the referee might be looking for that and giving a blue card. That's a dumb way to get a blue card. Really dumb. Um, tripping someone could be seen as a blue card offense. And then also any contact above the shoulder. Uh, there was a time last year where one of our players was just running um, did not mean to touch the guy, but just kind of was maybe trying to swim move past him, um, running and accidentally, like, I think hit like right here on the player. Uh, and the player didn't even react, but kept going. But the referee, like, was looking specifically for that. That was a point of emphasis last year. And the referee gave a blue card to our player. So any contact above the shoulder. Um, what happens when you get a blue card? You play a man down for two minutes. Uh, and as I mentioned, if the team that has a man up, if they score, then the power play is over. Uh, so we want to try not to give away blue cards. Um, yellow cards, any sort of misconduct, uh, taunting. I've also included some videos as well uh, for different examples that may have been seen in the past uh, for different uh, violations. Um, taunting, any simulation, diving, um, and then a hard tackle could be seen as a yellow card. Um, teams get fined, and you could potentially serve five minutes 
in the penalty box, depending on the penalty that's given. Um, so that could <laughs> that could be a deterrent as well from from doing certain things. You know, there are cards for a reason. Um, different reasons for red cards: uh, six foul accumulation, any sort of violent conduct. So six foul, uh, a six foul accumulation would be six fouls in one game. Counting just like in basketball in the NBA, if you get six fouls, you foul out. Only here you get a red card. Um, violent conduct, anything that's seen as violent, any sort of very threatening behavior and dissent, um, a really hard foul, uh, any direct uh, denial of a goal-scoring opportunity uh, would be a red card. Uh, drop, kick, kick, drop kicking an opposing player. <laughs> I put a video example of that just because I, I saw that when it did happen uh, many years ago and was, uh, you know, it's funny now in the moment, it wasn't funny, but, um, and then also headbutting a player is not allowed. That would be a red card offense. And there's other offenses that are in the laws of the game, but I just put some in here. Um, team gets fined. Uh, you have a one game suspension minimum and it could be further games suspended depending on the infraction uh subbing uh we are allowed to sub as many times as we want a player could go in and out of the game a thousand times if they wanted to um, we'll be subbing on the fly and that means you can sub at any time throughout the game a player can run off the field and then a player can run on the field but as I mentioned before, making sure that whoever you're subbing in for has already ran off the field before you have entered the field of play. All right. Um, potential violations would be subbing too early or even having too many players in the field. I think there was a time last year where the other team we were playing against just weren't keeping track of their players. Uh, the coach of the other team was just subbing one for one the entire game, didn't have lines set up. And someone ran on the field where they thought they were supposed to be on and they had too many players on the field. Okay. Uh, the result would be a blue card. Uh, there's an exception for the goalie. As soon as the goalie, let's say you want to pull the goalie, as soon as the goalie starts making a movement towards the bench, like running towards the bench, um, the player um, replacing the goalie is allowed to run onto the field. They cannot stop that movement and then run back to the goal if you lose possession. Once you start that movement towards the bench, you have to finish that movement in order to make that sub. Okay. Um, how we sub, this is how our club subs. Um, we want to be able to know when to sub. We don't sub when the other team has the ball attacking in a counterattack situation. Okay. That's not a good time to sub. And we'll discuss further about proper times to sub throughout uh, these projects. But really, it's if we have the ball in comfortable possession, we sub. If our goalkeeper gets the ball, the ball goes out of play, and um, you know, shot goes over top of the goal, and we're about to reset, goalkeeper gets the ball, right? It's a good time to sub. If we score a goal, great time to sub. If the other team scores a goal, should probably sub. Uh, if uh, our goalkeeper gets the ball and throw, dumps the ball, holds the ball for a few seconds, one, two, three, and throws the ball long in the corner, great time to sub. Um, but making sure that one, that that player uh, target four is battling for that ball. And two, making sure that, um, you know, we're ready for those subs and making them very, very quickly. Um, do not sub when the other team is in comfortable possession of the ball. Now, if the other team is in zone one and you're standing right next to your bench, and your mark is already uh, in maybe in zone one down there, um, that might be a decent time to sub depending on the flow of the game. And a lot of it comes from experience of playing and recognizing good times to sub and not good times to sub. You might not, um, you might sub at an awful time and get scored on because of it be your fault. And you realize, wow, maybe I shouldn't do that anymore. So I'm hoping that in watching some film, that you can see some of these examples, learn before you make these mistakes and not make them. Although that I do anticipate mistakes will be made at all levels of the game, even at the highest level, people make mistakes. Okay, make sure we're sprinting on and sprinting off the field. 
when there is someone, uh, when you're about to sub, if you're jogging off the field and just slowly jogging off, right, you are hurting everyone on the field and you're hurting even people off the field that are about to come on the field. You sprint on the field and you sprint off the field. Sprint, not a jog. You sprint off, you sprint on. Um, line one, line two, line three, that's the way we play. We have three lines. Uh, the first line will consist of five guys. The second line will consist of five guys. And the third line will consist anywhere between uh, three or four guys. Uh, we might be actually having that that line of four just stick together and then be able to sub in one, two, and three. Uh, but mostly we go from line one to line two, line one, line two. We might sub in someone from line three to line two, or we might have line three replace line two in one instance and someone designated from line two just to stay on. Uh, we have very short shift lengths. We're not on the field for eight minutes at a time. It's not how it works. We're on the field for anywhere between 45 seconds to two minutes. Um, you might be on for 17 seconds. Your team might, uh, your line might go on and score a goal and you sub off, right? That just might be your shift. So recognize you're giving as hard as you can for 45 seconds to 120 seconds. So really around one minute to two minutes. Um, know your role. Before the game is has started, all players will be given their role for that day and how long they should intend their shifts to be that day. Um, being aware on the field of what's around you and being aware that, hey, look, we're in a situation right now when I should sub or when I shouldn't sub. Um, we need to make sure that we're aware of different situations throughout the game. Hey, I just got a knock on my ankle, but I'm going to try and tough it out and continue to run. And I've realized I've been man marked with one of their most dynamic players and I'm not at my best might be a good time to sub next time the ball goes out of play, just to make sure. Um, we will have subbing partners between zone one and zone two, and sometimes zone three. Uh, I refer to this as sub buddies, where you'll have someone that you know, uh, if I'm playing and I run off the field, as soon as someone sees me starting to run, they're like ready by the door, ready to run out. Their focus is on me. Sometimes you're looking down the other side of the field looking at what's going on down there instead of being aware of your sub buddy. You need to be aware. There can't be a time where we're a man down for five seconds because you're not aware that your sub buddy has already ran off the field. That cannot happen. Um, we're going to have offensive power play opportunities. We're also going to have defensive power play opportunities. Offensive power plays, uh, we, will have, uh, we will have a man up throughout and we'll have a very specific uh, offensive power play routine, which we'll go through in other projects. But um, everyone will know who's on the offensive power play team. If the other team gets a blue card, people shouldn't be looking around saying, hey, wait, am I on this? Am I on this team? You should already know before the game if you're on the offensive power play or even a sub for the offensive power play. Then also for the defensive power play, if you are down a man, you will already know you're on the defensive power play team. Um, someone on our team is given a blue card, defensive power play team, run on, be ready. All right. Also, you should know if you're on the sixth attacker line, if we're down late in the game, or we just decide to go to the sixth attacker when we're up, right? Um, you should know who are actually going in for sixth attacker. If we say, Hey, sixth attacker, sixth attacker, and you're not on sixth attacker, you need to get off the field and you need to make sure that if you're, if you're a sixth attacker player, you need to get on the field. Okay. Um, other rules, no cleats are allowed. You can wear indoor soccer shoes or turfs, depending on the surface. Um, some fields are carpet, some are field turf. So, you know, the same surface that you would see on an outdoor soccer field. So with that, I would recommend having a pair of both, a pair of indoors, a pair of turfs. Uh, last season, I played the entire season with indoors and got away with it. But there were times where I said, man, maybe I wish I had turfs. Um, I would recommend that you have a pair of both. Uh, if you can't and you only have indoors, that's fine. You can get away with it. Um, yeah. uh, celebrations. There used to be a rule that, or it wasn't a rule, so we were able to take advantage of it, that when a goal is scored, everyone on the field, everyone that's on the benches can run out in the field, 
go and celebrate. I really liked that rule and I, or I really liked that ability to do that. Uh, but now there is a rule in place where when we score, uh, you cannot just run out on the field and celebrate. Only the players that are on the field can celebrate that goal. Uh, you can run over to the bench, high five people on the bench if you want, but you can't have the whole team run on out on the field. Okay. Um, let's see what else. Uh, roster size. Uh, you can roster 16 players per game and teams should roster 16 players. If they don't, they will get fined. Um, I, I believe maybe they're, um, I'm sorry, there is also, you're allowed 14 field players and two goalkeepers. So with that, um, at least two goalkeepers will be rostered every game. You need to roster a second goalkeeper for every game. So we'll do that. 14 field players, at least two goalkeepers uh, with a max roster size of 16 for that day. Uh, a new rule this season in 2020, 22 to 23, um, if a goalkeeper gets a blue card, then the goalkeeper has to go in the box and serve that offense. Last year, I was playing um, six attacker. I went in, put on a goalie uniform, and was just trying to – we were down and wanted to score a goal, and I committed a blue card offense. I'm not even sure what it was. I got a blue card, but someone else served the um, power play and uh, – or served the penalty, and I – um, cannot do that anymore. A goalkeeper cannot do that anymore. A goalkeeper has to serve their own blue card. So they would go to the bench or go to the penalty box area, and then the backup goalkeeper would come on the field. For laws of the game, this is the rule book. This is where you're going to find everything that you need to know. I don't expect you to memorize the entire thing to look through every single word on there, but just take a glance through it. Um, it's the MASL official rule book, and it's called the laws of the game. Moving on from rules, more focused now on different principles of the game and starting with some basic defensive principles. Uh, before every game, I'm going to give you a heads up of what to expect. Right? It's a picture from uh, 2022 season. I have the lines listed out here, defensive power play, offensive power play, sixth attacker some set pieces that we're looking at defensively, how to set up and some goals for the day. So there'll always be a plan of what's going on that day. But one of the first things we focus on is what to do defensively, because despite how many goals we score, in many cases, the goals that are given up, the dumb, stupid goals, which then lead to uh, a shift in momentum can be really big in terms of the out the final outcome of the game. If we are defensively not sound and we are not following our runners and doing some of these things improperly, then it's going to be a long, ugly game for us. So to start off, um, these are just some basic defensive principles, and I want to focus on these. Uh, first, defend with five behind the ball. That means that there are five field players behind the ball, not four and a goalie, five field players behind the ball. If the ball is in our own um, defensive zone, if and really like if it's in our zone one, right? If the ball is in our zone one, they're pressing us and they're, they're taking shots, taking shots, taking shots. We need to make sure everyone is behind the ball. A forward and outdoor stays up top, doesn't always track behind the ball. Some teams do have the forward track behind the ball and outdoor. In arena soccer, we need all five field players tracking behind the ball. Also, staying with your man. So important. I could get some random person off the street and say, hey, look, see this guy? Make sure to give him a big hug and follow him everywhere he goes. But at the same time, there's so many instances where we get caught ball watching, not paying attention, or just switch, switching off for a slight second, which allows this much separation, which then allows for a goal. Okay, um, so just being aware of that, stay with your man. And similar to that, follow your runner, which means that if you are defending a, like a defender on the other team, like they get the ball in uh, their own zone two, 
and play a ball into zone four, you can't just turn around and look at zone four because by the time you've turned around and looked, he could be making a run and already be like five steps ahead of you. So if you're marking someone and we'll get to zone two specific defense, but you have to follow your runner. If you don't, we will get scored on consistently. Follow your runner. And I include an example here. Uh, staying goal side of your man, which means that whatever side we're defending, stay goal side. You don't need to intercept every single pass. You shouldn't try to intercept passes uh, all the time, especially from a ball being played into the target forward. He's going to body you off the ball and just turn you and take a shot. Stop trying to win the ball off of someone that has their back to goal. Just force them backwards. You don't have to win that ball. So stay goal side of your man. A ball that hits the boards and misses the goal and bounces back. If you're not goal side, they have a wide open opportunity. So stay defensively goal side of your man. Ultimately, force your guy backwards. If they're in their zone four attacking, you need to force them back to zone three and then to zone two. That's ultimately what we want is be able to force them backwards and then eventually win a ball or the ball go out of play. It says abide by the line of confrontation that the coach has set. Sometimes we might set a line of confrontation at the third line, right? So the beginning from their zone one into their zone two, right across to that yellow line or whatever color it is in the field you're playing on, we might set that as a line of confrontation and say, hey, let them hold it in that area. Or we might set it at half field. Uh, in extreme circumstances, maybe it's even further back. So setting a line of confrontation and sticking to it is important. Um, the play is never over. The ball is always bouncing around, making sure that just because they took a shot, we don't look and take a look at the shot. And two seconds, your man is wide open and we just lost track of it. The play is never over. That works defensively. And it's also true on offense where you take a shot, follow up your shot, which leads us to some of our basic offensive principles. This is a shot from Henry. It says attack with three, two back. Very commonly, you'll see this, this sequence. You'll see it start with the goalkeeper, go to zone two, and then a ball be played in the zone four. And this is a good example here. The target forward's got the ball in zone four. Okay. This is how we want this to be set up and kind of look like. We want for there to be someone inside this D that can approach the ball. Let's say this target forward hits a ball off the wall and it bounces right here in the middle of the box. You don't want to be already inside the box too far because that deflection is going to happen so quickly off the wall that you might not have time to react to it. So this ball off the wall you're, if you're in the D, starting your run and moving forward and hitting it, you're able to adjust your run a little bit more. On the back side, we want to make sure this runner is somewhere where the D meets the box, okay, around in that area. So that way, if I, it, let's say I'm the target forward, if I hit the ball and it hits in here and starts trickling back post, we have someone that can clean that up. Or let's say I beat, um, let's say this is still me as a target forward and I take a shot and it goes far wide and starts rolling around the boards here, we need to make sure this guy is there to collect it. And if that ball does get hit around, right, and does move around the boards, then this guy is now holding it up. This guy is supporting. This guy is dropping back into the middle. This guy is moving to the, the where the D meets this box right here, okay? Uh, let's say that that's not an option. I'm fighting for it, and I have to play back. I can play this option right here. Or let's say they're just they're cutting off this side altogether and I have a wide open look here. If I play this guy, this guy might be able to take a wide open touch into this area and get a good shot off. Okay. Do recognize though this player is the furthest player back. The reason why this player is here and not all the way across the field is that if this ball is lost, and let's say they start breaking out. This person would then have to sprint all the way across to get back. He's already hanging out here, saving his energy or just being in a smart place. 
let's say they get the ball and clear it and it beats this guy up the line, right? This guy can then be the first person to track back, cut that off. This guy's tracking and everyone is looking to get behind the ball in that case. Okay, so attack with three. We get the ball in here, attack with three, but we have two back here. One, two, three, attacking. One, two, defensively. Okay, some common sequences that you'll see, as I mentioned already, you'll see the ball dumped in the corner and then go off the wall and hit someone either the top of box or back post. Um, making sure that you know this player is ready for anything that's coming in this area over here. You also have a drop option and you have a switch option. Right? Now, if this ball ends up coming here, right, the ball pops out, this guy maybe can start cheating over a little bit and look for the ball here. Um, or you can play that ball back all the way here. This guy pops out, and now we have our original setup. Okay, so make sure we're following our shots. If you miss a shot, follow it up. A basic offensive principle is that if you miss your shot, follow it up. Know when to counter. There are times where, oh my gosh, we just won the ball in our own attacking, um, I guess in our own zone one, we won the ball. And we're going to talk about this more when we talk in detail about zone one. We just won the ball. Should we actually be forcing the ball forward? Do we have an option to go forward? Do we have a target forward that's wide open that we can play? So being smart with that. Um, or, hey, I just won the ball in the middle of the field. Maybe I want to drop the ball first and build out of the back, especially a team that isn't pressing as hard. Uh, a common pass that you see happen, I mentioned it briefly, was a zone two in this zone right here to a zone four corner pass. And this is actually how the zones are broken up and then even more specifically subsections of each zone. So we have zone one, what we're building out of. And then we have zone two, Zone three, zone four. But notice there's 2A, 2B, 2C, 3A, 3B, 3C. And notice there's this left pocket, center pocket, right pocket, and we have our corners and our box. This left pocket and this right pocket are very dangerous areas, but not as dangerous as the center pocket. If you're guarding someone and they get the ball in zone three and they start to advance it into this left pocket, you have to be able to cut off that shot. And we're going to talk about that once we get into the zone specifics. I know I'm dumping a lot of information on you right now, but this is something that needs to be at least talked about early on. So notice that if we want to force them back, we're forcing them backwards, forcing them backwards defensively. Attacking wise, we want to identify that a pass from anywhere in zone two into zone four could lead to an attacking opportunity. A lot of times you see a ball from zone two to zone, zone four, and then even a ball from zone two to zone four to zone three, and then back to zone four. Typically, we don't build the field one at a time, zone one, zone two, zone three, zone four, and build up possession as we slowly work up the field. That's not typically how it works. Typically, we'll go from zone one to zone two, then we'll skip to zone four and then build possession in zone three and get an attacking opportunity, hopefully hitting the left pocket, center pocket, right pocket, or a ball back down to the corner. Right? If they do force us back and press us and we do get stuck back in zone two, we're looking back to zone four again. So that way we can either get an opportunity or push it back to zone three and build. Uh, wall crosses are very popular, hitting a ball off the wall, using the wall. You get the ball in the right or left corner, being able to play a ball off the wall that hits somewhere into the box for someone to crash onto. All right. And then there's the assignment for this project. This is where you're actually going to do something. So uh, the first step is just answer your following, answer the following questions in a Google Doc, Word Doc, notes, or text editor of your choice. It can also be handwritten. You're going to answer these questions. Each question, try to answer them in three to five sentences. First question, if you played in the MASL 3 last year, which of these rules took the longest to adjust to? These are just some rules we talked about today, and why? Which of these rules can make the biggest impact on a game if not followed? Um, there's a lot. That could be your answer. Um, there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer. You may have witnessed firsthand 
some rules that took a big impact on the game. Um, my biggest that I continue to stress is the top of arc reset, a defensive clearance. Please make sure, and we're going to work on this throughout training, but please make sure to avoid those defensive clearances. If you didn't play in the MASL 3 last year, this may apply to some of you, uh, which of these rules are new to you? Which of these rules do you think rookies struggle with most and why? And then I have the link again to the laws of the game, the MASL rules. And I've asked you to share a rule that wasn't discussed in this project. Just tell me a rule I didn't discuss and why this rule is important to know and maybe how it could affect the game. Observe rule 12 in the laws of the game. This is seven number four. Um, and name all the potential blue card offenses. Which position are you able to play of the positions on the field? Target forward, second forward, midfielder, defender, goalkeeper. And which is your preferred position? I can play every single one of those positions um, except a full-time goalkeeper. Uh, but I would prefer to play either as a target forward or as a defender. Um, describe your strengths as a player. Describe some areas of your game that need improvement. Now, be honest with yourself. Tell me areas that you want to improve on. You want to hold the ball up better. You want to be a player that is consistent in possession, that is able to find the zone two to zone four pass consistently. And then submit your answers once it's completed. Okay. Um, so make sure you go through, spend some time going through this project. Um, and answering those questions. And that is the rules and principles project.